So I would say that there, unless you see that the seller and agents start fighting with each other and start pointing the fingers, I would probably say the agent's not responsible. But if the seller suddenly starts blaming the agent, saying, no, 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 I didn't say tool shed, I said everything, then... Yeah. I would say that uh, the agent carries a level of responsibility, which is great for you because then you can claim from um, uh, like the Fidelity Fund. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, um, thanks, guys. That 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 really puts it into good perspective. Um, so a mention of um, a misrepresentation and also disclosure forms or non-disclosure forms. Um, we do have uh, um, some videos on the um, on the PLA YouTube channel with regards to, we've discussed, I believe, um, non-disclosure forms or disclosure forms. So please go through to our channel and have a look at other, those videos as well. Um, I think that does cover the first um, question. Um, we are going to move on to our second question, which I believe is from Mark um, and Nick. I think you're gonna be taking um, control of this question. Um, Mark's question refers to transfer duty, right? And in, it's a very short question, but I believe that the answer actually requires some sort of um, detail from a conveyancing perspective, actually. Um, so if the question goes, if two entities purchase a property jointly, right? One entity being a company and one being a trust, right? And then they subdivide, right? The property or the land. Is it possible to end up with each entity owning one half without paying transfer duty a second time? So right. that, yeah, that is the, 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 the question there, Nick. And I believe that we're gonna have um, some important point pointers uh, with, the, with, with this one um, with regards to pro the, the value of the property, um, the relevance of the half share, right? Is, is it relevant or not? We'll be going into obviously the threshold of, of the transfer duty, and whether do you want to would you subdivide subdivide first, and then yeah, what sort of step would you take next, Nick? Perfect. Yes. Okay. So so it's an interesting question. Um, obviously the one the one thing that this this question doesn't give us is numbers, and when it comes to transfer duty, the important thing are the numbers. Okay. So we're going to do a sort of high level how this works. Obviously. Transfer duty payable on a transfer of a property uh, value over a million. So you only pay transfer duty on any value over a million rand. Okay, so threshold is a million. So, so the minute I look at a question like this, my first question is, well, what is our property value? Because then we need to look at, at what the definition is and what we're actually paying transfer duty on. This question would be absolutely null if we have a property which is valued at a million rand. Okay, because then transfer duty is not payable no matter what you do. You can subdivide it as many times, but it's highly unlikely that we've got a property here that is worth only a million if number one, they're asking this question and number two, they want to subdivide it. Okay, because uh, subdividing a property under a million rand, you're probably going to have difficulties because I imagine it's not that big a property. But, you know, again, um, without the numbers, we, we can't really, we can't really determine. Um, now, in respect of, of the way that they've positioned the question. So they have said, we are going to buy a property. They've got a company and a trust that are going to buy the singular property. And at that stage, they're then going to subdivide into two particular properties. Now, remember, when two entities, no matter what the entities are, buy a property together, okay? Mm -hmm. Lots of people can do this. You can do it as a natural person. You can do it as they're doing here with two, um, two uh, juristic entities. Who are purchasing a property you purchase that property in indivisible shares okay so there's no such thing as you know i own this half of the house and you own that half of the house that doesn't exist in our law indivisibly you own that property together okay and you own all of it together all right the plan that they have here is to then subdivide this particular property and i think what they're asking is the intention is obviously one person is going to after subdivision own that subdivided half and the other person is going to own this subdivided half here. Okay. Now, the tricky part with this is, is during that subdivision of the particular property, it's never going to work out exactly like that because after the subdivision occurs, both parties are going to own each subdivided portion together. Okay. okay. And they're going to own each of those subdivided portions 100% from one another. And what would end up happening is you would then have to transfer the properties once again 
and go through the whole registration process and transfer those properties formally into 50% of those into each other's names so that each party owns one of the subdivided portions. Okay. It's it's difficult. Um, it, it's a, a tricky process to do, but it obviously can be done. In my view, I don't think if you did it in that way, you could avoid transfer duties on the second, on the second transfer. Okay. Again, we have to look at numbers here because now you, you're considering transfer duty. Transfer duty is calculated on the value of the property always. Um, but there might be a 50% payable um, by, by the party in the circumstances after you, when you're working with the subdivided portions. But certainly you're going to have to look at transfer duty and gear it on the value of the property itself. Okay, so I don't think transfer duty in those circumstances is avoidable. Um, I think there is a way which you could potentially do it where there's only a single transfer, but I'll let Bruno touch on that just Sure. Um, so a nice, a nice creative way, is, and I see a lot of guys do this because it also avoids the need of constantly having to refinance properties. So unless you've actually got the cash to pay for it, what a lot of property developers do is they go in and they make an offer subject to a suspensive condition. Um, and in fact, you don't actually even need to make it subject to a suspensive condition, but you make an offer, but you just defer the transfer of the property until you've actually subdivided, until you've subdivided the property. So the contract's in place. Uh, you can even do it as an installment sale agreement if you want it secured at the deeds office. You just need to structure it like an installment sale agreement. And then you pend the subdivision, which is going to be a hell of a lot longer than a year. Uh, you can pay off the property in the meantime in installments, so you don't pay it off at once. Um, but now you wait. And then as soon as the subdivision is affected, um, then, uh, then obviously you guys can have the conversation over who takes transfer. But uh, the nice thing with it is you'd have the possibility there of being able to, in fact, sorry, uh, let me correct myself. The installment sale agreement would be problematic because that means that you'd be entering the contract at that moment in time over that property with the entities already. So SARS would see that as a, um, as a sale and technically you'd have to pay transfer duty on that. So maybe that's not the best idea. So what you could potentially do is enter into an option agreement as an example for the purchase of the property subject to it being subdivided. Um, you could undertake the subdivision. You could hold some form of security over it. Uh, there's a lot of creative ways of doing it. Long story short, You've got a contract, makes it subject to subdivision. You don't take transfer yet. And only on subdivision, then each one of you takes transfer of that subdivided share. Um, if the properties are actually under a million rand each, then you don't pay transfer duty even for the first transaction. Uh, but if they are over above, uh, over a million rand, then it'll still probably be less than buying both properties, bearing in mind the scale of transfer duty. The, the, the more expensive the property, the higher the transfer duty payable, meaning that theoretically, if you're calculating it on two lower value properties, as opposed to one higher value, you're actually going to pay less transfer duty collectively, and you're only going to technically do it once, um, it, it, one to the trust, one to the company. So yeah, that's just an idea. So obviously, we need to wrap our heads around the contracts, but something along the option agreement, I think, could could very well do the trick. Yeah. Great. There you go. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, th thank you, Bruno. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, a very, very, very high level um, answer, um, which obviously um, feeds to the fact that if you're going to be entering these types of um, agreements, it, it is very important to actually um, contact um, an attorney, um, of course, one who is part of PLA, um, to actually have a conversation with you before you actually um, um, enter into this um, sort of agreement. And with that being said, and maybe and guys within um, with um, conclusion, if you've uh, you've just opened a company or a trust, right, and you are approached by another company or another trust, and they want to maybe purchase a property with you or with your company for whatever reason, right? Um, what are the, some of the things, and maybe just maybe two or three things that um, one can do sort of due diligence on that other company or trust before entering into any type of um, deal with them or any type of partnership. Um, obviously, we know with companies and trusts, there's directors, there's trustees. So what's the due diligence that would almost, um, you'd advise one to do um, on either or of those, just to ensure that they don't enter into 
a shark tank because this is a property law, so it can become quite costly. Uh, Nick, do you want me to take it? Do you want? Yeah, to? I'll take it, Bruno. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, me or you? No, you go ahead. Oh, yeah, you, you go ahead. <laughs> So, um, so when it comes to when it comes to any sort of corporate relationship, you treat it exactly like that, right? Um, at the end of the day, the best relationships are made or created by virtue of contracts and agreement uh, and um, agreements. But what I mean by that, and it's actually quite funny. So when when we as lawyers draft these type of contracts between parties what actually lands up happening isn't just a complicated contract that governs what parties already know, but lawyers have just made 50 pages out of it. Um, what I actually realize happens more often than not is that we design the relationship as we go along in the contract, because it's very easy for you and I to say, we're going to buy a property, it's 50-50 and there we go. But there's never conversations over, but what if I want to sell and you don't? What if you want to sell and I don't? Uh, what happens if the property gets, uh, what happens if we don't have tenants? Uh, is one of us supposed to cover? Uh, and then I go, but you knew I didn't have a lot of money. So I gave you the money up front, but I thought you would cover any subsequent debt. And that's how things start going wrong. So the first first and foremost, right, commercial terms need to be agreed to. The parties need to understand the relationship between each other, but this relationship needs to be put into a format that gets a bit stress tested. And this stress test, you often find that attorneys can provide by running through different scenarios as they draft the contract. Unless, unless for some reason um, it's not enough that just an attorney does it, then you can bring in other stress tests like whatever, an accountant or a value or whatever the case is, right? But you have to stress test the deal first so that you know commercial viability is there, right? And that will then create legal, uh, legal obligations. So that's the first thing. If you do that, who the other company is is almost irrelevant because you've got a good contract covering you. Yes, personally, I've got a, um, a belief that you should only get into business with people that you do trust. So if you do want to take it a step further and say, look, I know that the contract's so strong that I'm covered, but I want to make 100% sure that this person isn't dishonest or whatever the case is. Unfortunately, situations like that start becoming very difficult, but you have to start digging around. So you might want to look at certain basic things like their, their books, their, their financial records of the company, financial statements, so the annual financial statements. Then you actually compare this to what's been submitted to STAR. So you can actually ask them for the annual financial statements and then try to figure out what their assessments were and compare it because just to see what sort of character you're dealing with. Um, you know, make sure that they've got a, a SARS compliance. So they've got um, they've got everything in order. And this is very easy to do off the SARS website. You can do this almost for anyone. So you go check uh, SARS compliance. You obviously want to check things like judgments against them. You want to check for judgments against the directors. Um, and that'll give you an indication on whether their past conduct has brought them into any trouble. Uh, but yes, it doesn't really deal with any present conduct. So if at this moment in time, they're going around this company incurring debt left, right and center, there's no way of you knowing. And you probably want to just make sure that your contracts are in place so that if they do do something that's dishonest, you can force them out of their shares by doing a share buyback and taking the shares back away from them or something like that. They will, yeah, there you go. Um, th yeah, th thank you very much, um, Bruno. So yeah, that was almost like a, a bonus question and answer right there. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, that's the benefit of, of having a host, I guess, just we can just bounce things um, back, back and forth a bit. Um, yeah, I believe that was episode um, 131. So yeah, um, thank you guys for this week and we'll see you next week on episode um, 132, if memory serves correct. Cool. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.